Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Varun Sriram with Generation UCAM, and we are absolutely thrilled to be joined today by Will Fleming, top performance coach. Will, how are you doing today? I'm excellent. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, we're really excited to, uh, to pick your brain, and, and our topic today specifically is Olympic lifting. Uh, so for those of you that have followed along with these UCAN chats that we've done um, over the course of the last couple of years, you may notice we're deviating a little bit from our, our standard endurance topics, out, but we're really excited to talk about Olympic lifting with Will, and, and Will's going to give us a great idea about why Olympic lifting can benefit all types of athletes, not just your traditional power athletes, but but for athletes, for average gym goers, um, everyone out there. Uh, Will, before we dive really deep into the meat of our topic, um, how did you come into this world? What what drew you to Olympic lifting, and, and why is it something that that you believe in and have a passion for? Yeah, so this is um, this is kind of my uh, origin story, how I got started with coaching, how I got started with weightlifting, how I got started as a gym goer was I had started playing football in high school um, and I had a fairly unremarkable like freshman year of high school in football uh, but then my sophomore year I got the opportunity to start varsity uh, for my team uh, due to there's a couple older guys who had injuries but I knew what I was doing but I was really undersized I was I'm only 510 but I was 510 probably 155 160 pounds and we were playing our crosstown rival in football and they were one of the top ranked teams in the state, but I was really excited to play him. And uh, I was playing linebacker, and there was a play that I can just remember as vivid uh, as it happened yesterday. Uh, but there was a play where I was supposed to, I was supposed to like meet the fullback into the hole, and then the, line, the other linebacker would come make the tackle on a running back. And so they handed off the running back. I recognized that I'm going to go make, you know, make the tack or make the beat the blocker in the hole. And I end up five, six yards down the field on my back, and I see the running back going you know, towards the end zone for a touchdown. And it was, uh, you know, in, in the moment, embarrassing, uh, kind of became funny, but also embarrassing the next day because uh, if anybody ever played football, you know, your coach is showing game film. And my coach was horribly inept at, like, rewinding and fast-forwarding game film, but on this day, he just was so good. He could just rewind it to begin of that play over and over and over. So I just watched it probably a hundred times, and I've seen it in my head uh, forever. Uh, but I, I thought, man, I'm just not big enough or fast enough to compete in this game. And I, I started really kind of started. I'd played all the sports when I was young. I'd wrestled and I'd swam and I'd done gymnastics and track and baseball and basketball, everything that I could get could do. But I'd really kind of decided I wanted to be a football player at the time. And so I, I decided, hey, I want to, I, I need to get stronger. I, before that season, I had run a 5-2 40-yard dash, which if we saw the NFL combine from, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, it's a full second slower than the fastest guy. So I was, you know, I was not slow, not fast. I was not big. I was 155 pounds. I was not particularly strong. So I said, hey, I got to get bigger. I got to get faster. I got to get stronger, that kind of uh, classic thing. And so I asked around, and I found out where the running back, and the fullback from that team that we had played, they were their best players, and I found out where they had, they were lifting weights and training. So I decided I'm going to go there, and I'm going to uh, get as good as them. And so I went into that place, and I said, hey, I want to be a good football player. I want to be as good as this guy Shane and Nick. Uh, how do I do it? And the coach there said, yeah, well, absolutely we can do that. We'd love to have you. We're an Olympic weightlifting club. Uh, you know, we're, you're just going to – all you have to do is you have to – you know, you're going to compete periodically in weightlifting, uh, but we'll train you just like we train them, and you'll get as good. And so I was like, sure, I'll do whatever. And within two years, uh, you know, this is my sophomore year of high school. Uh, by my senior year, I had I'd started competing. I won the junior national championships in weightlifting. I'd won a state championship in track and field as a shot putter. I was no longer 5'10", 155 pounds. By my senior year, I was 215 pounds. I'd run a 4.540 instead of a 5.2. Uh, you know, I'd cleaned all that you know, weight and all that kind of stuff. And so, as a coach, you know that that showed me the impact that a coach could have on a young athlete. So I said, hey, that's something I really want to pursue. So that's how I got into coaching. And then, you know, as a sport, that's just how I got into it. I just knew that it worked, and it helped me develop into a great athlete. So it's a method that I like to use with all the athletes that are appropriate who come into my gym, even this day, almost 20 years later. 
it's obviously something that that story that you told that you know that seems to have, have very much shaped um, your your personal philosophy and, and I guess not only the story but but sort of the experience that you had and the improvements you were able to make with Olympic lifting. Um, and we might get into this a little bit more uh, further, but just one thing to note that was interesting. You know, you talked about you started it in over two years. You bulked up from you know 150 to 215, I believe you said. And and, and that element of it is probably something that most people it's apparent, right? They think that this is a way to add mass. But then you also talked about the significant improvement you made in your speed. Um, what did you benefit? What what benefits did you see when when you got serious about Olympic lifting? You know, kind of beyond what, what might be considered the obvious benefit of just becoming bigger. Yeah. So you know, uh, weightlifting movements themselves aren't the like kind of cause of a lot of mass gain. That was like concerted effort I was eating more and all that kind of stuff like you would if you wanted to gain a lot of mass um, but the big things were speed and power right I had uh, I think I had a, a 24 26 inch vertical jump before my sophomore year of high school and a 5 240 but my senior year I'm 60 pounds heavier and I had a 36 inch vertical jump and I had a five or a four five forty right so uh, if you know, you kind of look at that, the best way to look at power output is somebody's body weight versus their vertical jump. And so my vertical jump went up over 10 inches, almost 12 inches, uh, but I gained 60 pounds. So I'm just producing much more force, a lot more power. I'm a much more explosive athlete. Um, and, you know, in the confines of football and track and field and weightlifting, which I was uh, competing in primarily by my senior year of high school, you know, my extra mass was also a good thing, uh, but number one amongst all those things was just getting stronger and more powerful. So, you know, Olympic lifting has obviously become something that's that's a big part of, of your philosophy and your training philosophy with athletes. Um, can, can you just sort of speak to kind of your overall philosophy when it comes to training and, and how does Olympic lifting, you know, fit into that philosophy or, or maybe it kind of is at the very core of that philosophy? Yeah, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I think about things as, like, methods are many, principles are few, uh, methods may change, principles never do. So the method of, of training to me is Olympic lifting, right? Or, but the principle to me is that athletes need to be more explosive. So most athletes in nearly, uh, in almost every sport can benefit from things like improved rate of force development, uh, increased power output, more fast twitch muscle fiber, fast twitch muscle fiber development, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that my philosophy as a coach is that I want to make all the athletes that I run into uh, in some way more powerful, more explosive, stronger, uh, because for most field court and track sports, uh, all of those things, if you can, if you're more powerful, more explosive, you can uh, change direction faster, you can sprint faster, you can um, you can jump higher, you can jump higher repeatedly, all those sorts of things uh, that are really important to those athletes in, in different sports. The method of Olympic lifting is sometimes appropriate for athletes and sometimes inappropriate. So, you know, some of the examples where we've had professional baseball players in the gym and we have them for a short period of time in their off season because the baseball off season like shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. They get done in, you know, November sometimes and then start back up in February and they got to take some time off. So I may have eight weeks with an athlete, and in that case, I'm not going to really focus on the Olympic lifts or even teach them how to do them, but I am going to do something that's going to help that athlete become more explosive or more powerful. So, you know, you could have plyometrics or uh, weighted sprinting or all that kind of stuff is also going to be uh, improved uh, motor unit recruitment, so they're going to be able to fire faster, pick the bigger muscle fibers first, or... You know, they may have greater rate of force development, so if they need, when they need to turn it on to sprint or uh, whatever, they, they can do it. So it's just the principle itself, athletes should be more powerful. Uh, more powerful athlete usually wins. The method is, you know, weightlifting in a lot of senses. So with my high school athletes that I know I'm going to have long term, uh, my elite athletes that I'm going get to uh, get to train for a long period of time, we're probably going to choose some variation of an Olympic lift to accomplish that feat of getting stronger, more powerful. In terms of the athletes you train, you gave us a little bit of perspective on that, but um, but what what types of athletes are you working with, um, generally speaking? Yeah, so we run the gamut, you know, so day-to-day, 
it's primarily middle school, high school athletes uh, who live in the local area, and they play all sorts of sports. We've had 80 athletes go to two Division One levels and uh, any sport you can think of. Had over 200 athletes play at all levels, uh, Division Two, II, Division Three, NAIA, junior college. Um, so those athletes a lot of times will come back to us in the summer, uh, and so we'll have collegiate athletes throughout the summer. And then we've had uh, we've had athletes in pro in Major League Baseball, the NBA, NFL. Um, we had 10 athletes at uh, the Olympic Trials in 2012 uh, and 2016 in track and field. Um, so we've we've had you know athletes in all sorts of sports, all different skill levels, uh, and then you know a big population that we have are the day-to-day -day competitive uh, you know adult athletes who may pursue uh, endurance uh, 5K to ultras, um, you know all that kind of stuff as well. So you were talking um, about you know kind of the method um, and, and Olympic lifting being one of the methods, what is, for the layman, what is Olympic lifting and, and what, you know, kind of sets it apart from other types of, of strength training that people might also consider to be lifting? Yeah, so uh, Olympic lifting are the two events that are contested in uh, the Olympic Games. So classically, uh, Olympic, Olympic lifting purists would say, oh, it's just called weightlifting, uh, but it gets kind of confusing when you start doing that. And, but uh, so the sport of weightlifting, Olympic lifting, is uh, the snatch and the clean and jerk and their variations. So the snatch is one motion from the ground to overhead, typically with a wider grip, and the clean and jerk is to the chest and then overhead uh, with a more narrow grip. And so uh, they have you know countless variations where you do a power clean, which anybody who ever uh, who's done high school sports in the last 20 years has probably done a power clean, uh, you know hang snatch. Uh, power snatch, all that kind of stuff. So there's all these different variations of the lifts uh, that you could use in your training. Uh, so when we say we're doing Olympic lifting with our athletes, we're doing some variation uh, of those lifts, whether it's a hang snatch or hang power snatch or hang clean or hang power clean. Um, and anybody obviously who's done CrossFit in the last uh, you know, 10, 15 years since that's come about has done some variation of an Olympic lift at some point. When people are getting started with Olympic lifting, um, I'm, you know, what do you, what would you say are, are the biggest challenges, or, or what do you often maybe see as like the barrier to entry when you're training an athlete or working with an athlete who hasn't yet gone through Olympic lifting? Is it sort of more about like intimidation of the movements, or, or would you say it's maybe not just knowing the value that it has in terms of making it a more explosive athlete? Yeah, um, you you definitely hit one of them one of the nails right on the head, and it's intimidation with the movements because they're pretty dynamic, the bar's moving fast. Um, you know, if you go to the uh, wrong gym, people are slamming the bars down, making it loud, you know, pretty loud noises and stuff like that. So that can be intimidating. Uh, just taking a bar overhead uh, dynamically can be intimidating. So there's definitely a factor of intimidation. Uh, then there are also fairly technical lifts. So uh, when I'm mentioned before that, you know, we'll have pro baseball players who are on a short schedule. Um, there's a there's a time that it would take to teach someone how to lift, and uh, I've gotten really good at it. And our staff is really good at it, so it may take two or three days, um, but, you know, you might it might take you weeks and weeks and weeks. I always tell the formative story of when I uh, started weightlifting, uh, my coaches made me stay at, like, uh, some really low weights for the first six weeks just so that I could develop the right technique. So that was, that's one of the things. So it's, they're technical and they're intimidating. Um, I think if you watch them, uh, it's pretty intuitive. You would say, oh, that's going to help me move faster, jump higher, all that kind of stuff. He's like, I'm moving a heavy weight fast. That would make sense that I would jump fat, uh, jump higher, run faster, all that kind of stuff. So I don't know if it's, uh, the benefits kind of aren't, aren't immediately apparent, but once you do them once or twice, you go, oh, that would make sense how that's going to do it. So let's let's stay with the athlete, um, since th that's what we're talking about. Can, can you give an example of, of perhaps two different uh, athletes from, say, two different sports that are both benefiting from Olympic lifting, but may find, like, a different benefit out of it? Like, I don't know if this would be the example, but say, like, you know, a basketball player versus a football player, you know, different skills, different movements, different needs. Uh, any example like that? 
I think you're going to find that most athletes are going to benefit uh, in the large scale sense uh, where they're going to have uh, their fast twitch muscle fiber is going to benefit from it, uh, which is going to lead to uh, the benefit. So the fast twitch muscle fiber, the rate of force development, uh, these like um, kind of just explosive characteristics uh, in general are going to benefit the uh, the athlete in any sport, but specifically, then you're going to start picking picking out benefits where um, you know football coaches will always say that they love the Olympic lifts because it's like the hips and you know, all extend or get you know they call it you know triple extension and this triple extension posture is the same posture that you might see in a tackle as an athlete goes through a tackle. The basketball player might see a specific benefit in terms of uh, their ability to jump or uh, something like that. The track athlete, even though, and this is where we go from general to specific, the general adaptation is that fast switch muscle fiber. The specific carryover is uh, they're more they're more explosive when they kick, or a sprinter might see them be more explosive out of the blocks. You know, we'll even we always we have some really successful swimmers in the gym uh, in the sprint events, and you know, swimming totally different than almost every sport, but out of the blocks, uh, they see a huge benefit because they're faster to react and jump and take off and explode out of the block. So um, the general benefit is that fast switch muscle hypertrophy where they're growing more fast switch muscle or it, they're training it more or the you know physiological changes and like energy utilization. But the specific benefit would be really different in a lot of different sports. And I think it's interesting, you know, you use the example of the track athlete and, and the runner in, in terms of talking about that kick. And, uh, you know, we likely have a lot of runners or track athletes um, that are on the line. And, and this is sometimes, you know, the, the, the endurance athlete or maybe not the endurance athlete per se, but the runner might not right away associate that need to Olympic lift with, with their sport. Uh, what have you seen in your experience working with runners? Obviously, people are trusting in you and in your training philosophy, um, so you know they might not push back on what you're saying. But have you kind of gotten that pushback where track athletes or runners have been like, "Do I is this really something that's going to benefit me?" No, it's interesting actually. Uh, that you asked that question is we had we were training an elite group of distance athletes from uh, like 800 to 10k, and that group uh, had like a world championship team member. Uh, in the 3,000 meter steeplechase, and uh, we had uh, 10 athletes at the Olympic trials in 2012 when that group was still together. Um, and so I was actually kind of keeping the Olympic lifts away from them in that, like, I thought, hey, they're, they're getting a lot of impact because these are guys who are 100 plus miles a week, uh, you know, running a lot. And so I was like, hey, maybe we'll keep the impact lower and we'll develop, a, you know, the explosive muscle fibers through more med ball work or uh, some you know low level jumps or something like that, and and the guys on the team and the females on the team came to me and were like, hey, we want you to teach us how to Olympic lift because we want to do that. I can I can tell that's going to help us, right? And so we put that in uh, in that 2012 season, 2011 2012 season, and saw some really big benefits 2011 2012 2013 when I had uh, one of the guys on the team make the world championship team. So we saw a lot of those benefits and, and they were actually really open to it. And they, you know, these are professional athletes. So they're, you know, trying to find the best methods and all that kind of stuff. So they, but they dug it out of me. They said, Hey, you got to do this. Right. Um, but it was really beneficial. You, you know, they, uh, they, they all saw, you know, improvements, you know, uh, verbally where they're like, Hey, you know, I'm, my kicks are better. Right. Uh, I'm able to call on those fast switch muscle fibers. I'm able to call on that uh, that energy system to go at the end of races. I like what this is doing for me. When you're working with athletes um, and and they're utilizing Olympic lifting as part of their training, um, how often are we talking? Is there and, and is there different frequencies based on you know if if they're in sort of like a build phase or, or like really trying to get explosive versus like doing it more for maintenance how, how do you how do you go about kind of implementing it yeah, yeah so our programming uh for them in, in the off season would be 
more frequent strength training sessions because that's more of like a general physical preparedness time where they're doing things that are going to have some carryover, uh, but not like really specific care. You know, it's not going to be specific carryover. It's just like you're improving the organism, right? You're improving the whole system at, in that general physical preparedness time, that GPP phase. And then as they go into the season, but uh, the, as they go into the season, because they're specific preparedness, their running mileage, uh, their LT runs, their, you know, all that kind of stuff is in, increasing. We're going to decrease the amount or frequency we're in the weight room. Maybe we, we were three, four times in the off season and we're two times in season because we're trying to maintain a lot of those, uh, those physical adaptations we've made. Uh, but the actual structure of a session for us is, with an athlete is we train total body every day. We just alternate whether it's like a push day or a pull day. So, you know, uh, a push day you could kind of imagine uh, would have like uh, stuff that's going to be front side muscles, right? So upper body pushing, uh, we might put uh, that day might have a snatch variation and then we make squat or lunge or something like that, whereas a pull day, we're going to do more posterior chain, so we're doing a row with the upper body. We may do a clean on that day because it's a little more taxing, and we may do some, you know, uh, RDL or hinging variation, a deadlift variation on the pull day that's going to help, uh, you know, so then they can then they can alternate those days. We don't break it up body parts. We say front side, back side, push, pull, uh, but we'll train some sort of element. If we think you need to be more explosive, we're going to train some sort of explosive movement and then we're going to do, you know, push variations or pull variations. So, uh, we, you know, we may do it three days a week, four days a week, or two days a week, uh, just depending on the time of the year. We've talked about, um, you know, the Olympic lifting a lot in the context of, of building the more explosive athletes. Uh, and I think some of what you were just talking about in terms of just building that total body, um, relates to this next question I'm going to ask you, but what about, the benefits of Olympic lifting for those athletes that are looking for fat loss, but, you know, also obviously trying to maintain that muscle to, to perform. Um, what have you seen and, and what are the benefits of Olympic lifting um, for that purpose from a body composition? Improvement? Yeah. So, yeah. So in the dosage wise, um, these, these are primarily obviously are going to be like the physiological changes, but you will see benefits uh, in terms of, if you are in, you know, this kind of body composition phase of your training, uh, where um, motor unit recruitment, so recruiting the largest motor units in your body, half they have to read, you know, uh, your muscle fibers and nerves work on like a, uh, you know, the, the demand that they are that they are placed under. Um, the smaller the demand, the smaller the motor unit they're going to recruit, right? So your body's always going to recruit the smallest thing that is possible to do the work that it needs to do. So uh, to recruit the largest muscle fibers, you need to do things that are explosive uh, and you know high intensity. So you want to do things like uh, lift heavy weights fast, right? So Olympic lifts are really good in terms of recruiting those muscles. Uh, so you could see, you know, you're going to see uh, composition change. You could see hypertrophy effects, but they're also uh, in that like uh, epoch kind of post-exercise oxygen consumption, when they are fatigued, they're gonna the bigger motor units are gonna re are call on more resources to repair, and so you're gonna see some extra fat burn uh, or you know fat loss and those kind of sorts of situations. We've talked a lot about you know athletes and and kind of these. Um, competitive athletes, I guess you would say, whether it's high school or, or other types of athletes you work with. You also talked about working, you know, just adults and however we want to characterize them, sort of, I guess, the average gym goer. And, and, and these folks, in a lot of instances, you know, if they're, like you mentioned, doing CrossFit or if they're, you know, competing in some type of Spartan race, I mean, they're also trying to improve their performance and, and you know, certainly are athletes as well. Um, but for that average person that's, you know, not trying to get a D1 scholarship or, or compete, you know, at the top of the level at, at, you know, some type of professional or collegiate sport, um, what do you see as the benefit of Olympic lifting just for that person that's worried about maintaining good physique, um, being fit, being healthy? 
Yeah, so, you know, one of the first things we see, like, in aging, right, because the thing that we're, like, really fighting against when you, as you become an adult, uh, somewhat competitive, or just a gym goer, right, is you're fighting, like, yeah. aging. The first thing that goes is muscle power production, right? So, so for less light, less you'll be able to form more quick, quick. So, uh, so in those sorts of you want to have, have we want to have those we athletes. Have those athletes. I'm getting a little echo. I'm a little echo. Yeah, let me uh, let me put my set in. That might help us out here. Go. We good? All right, sweet. Um, so with those athletes doing things that produce power and Olympic lifts are one of them. Uh, those are going to be really great for those athletes to kind of stave off that, so that they have that uh, type, you know, that fast twitch muscle fiber types that are in there so that they can still be recreationally competitive. So that's, that's one really good thing. The other thing that's like almost not thought of is they are technically complex, right? So a lot of gym goers, it gets really boring to go to the gym and bench on Mondays and squat on Wednesdays and deadlift on Fridays and like, you know, you can get stronger, you don't get stronger, it may get frustrating, you know, whatever. The Olympic lifts are really cool and we found this with, uh, you know, we have a, we have a competitive weightlifting team. We also have all our athletes doing it. But a lot of our adults are like, hey, teach me how to do that. That looks cool, right? And then they get bought in and they love it because you can not only just make strength improvements, right? You can, you can, you know, if your squat goes up, you're clean or your snatch or your jerk's probably going to go up. So you can improve strength-wise, but you can improve technically and continue to, you know, you don't get any stronger necessarily, but you can improve technically which, and your lifts go up. So it's really a thinking, you know, a thinking person's lift, right? So if you go into the gym and you want to be challenged a little bit to think and, you know, you, that's why you see a lot of video, you know, phones out uh, in gyms, you know, people video it, watch it back, say, hey, what can I do better? So it, it gives you a little more thought or uh, that you can put into the gym that makes it a little more exciting potentially. So I think, you know, making sure uh, we continue – being able to produce power later in our lives, but also give you a little something to pursue um, uh, that is, uh, you know, difficult and challenging but rewarding. So that's kind of the, you know, the, the thing that doesn't get researched a lot. You get a lot of research studies on fast twitch muscle fiber and loss of power as people age. You don't get, you know, research studies on how much fun it is to, like, get better at something that's technical, you know. That's that's such a great point, you know. I mean, that's really in terms of sticking with it and committing to it, and and ultimately being able to see the results of consistency. There has to be, you know, some enjoyment that comes out of it. If there's yeah. not, I guess, a career purpose that it's yeah. tied into. Um, what would be is it like like a sample kind of um, how many times a week? So somebody like myself, I'm I'm more interested in just that overall maintaining good physique, health, and fitness. Um, if I started working with you. You got me technically to a point where I was ready. Um, what might be like a sample week? How often I would do it? How long I would do it? And maybe you could even take us through like one sample workout that you would even um, prescribe. Yeah. Um, so you know, there's all sorts of different trains of thought on how to do this. But you know, the recreational person who's like, you know, hey, I want to be pretty athletic. I want to look good, and I want I want to include Olympic lifts because I think they're fun, and I you know I want to be better at those. That kind of person. Once we have that technical base established, I've, they've worked with somebody in person or uh, they worked with somebody online who's kind of gotten their uh, lifts together. Uh, that kind of person, I would say, uh, you know, snatch on Monday or Tuesday or whatever, clean and jerk uh, or a variation. And I say, I'll say snatch or a variation, clean and jerk or a variation, uh, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, and then, you know, your third day a week, maybe you do both lifts. And so, you pick one, you focus on that, and usually uh, when you're first starting out, we would do like some variation that is a little shorter. So we do like a hang snatch plus an overhead squat so you can get better at different technical parts. Uh, and then on that day, snatches I usually pair with some sort of squat because snatches typically aren't as heavy. So we'll, t we'll pair it with, with a squat, which is pretty heavy. So maybe it's a front squat variation. And then on the clean and jerk day, we might do a pull. So we might do a, a deadlift with a clean grip or an RDL or something like that. So we're training most of your chain. And then on that third day, 
maybe do both lifts. Um, and early on, you're doing higher reps because you just want practice. And then as you get more accustomed to it, you do just a really linear periodization where you might do sets of four to five for two or three weeks, then sets of three for two or three weeks, and then lower sets like twos and ones, and then cycle back through that maybe with a different variation. Um, so linear periodization works really well with Olympic lifts if you want to improve on them because uh, you get that change and that strength base with the higher reps, then you're developing uh, and maybe some muscle endurance, and then you're developing uh, some more power, and then finally maximal power and maximal strength when you get in those twos and ones. Awesome. Well, so we've gotten a, a really pretty great and comprehensive look at, at your training philosophy and all, all the different types of folks that Olympic lifts can benefit, and also kind of some general education on what Olympic lifting actually is. Um, I want to move now, we, we've covered training, um, spend about the last 15 minutes we have talking a little bit about nutrition, and um, this time I just want to add that anybody in the audience, uh, the live audience, does have any questions for Will. Um, once we speak a little bit about nutrition, we'll save the last um, four or five minutes to, to throw a couple questions Will's way. So if you do have any questions for Will right now, you can um, feel free to submit them to us uh, right there in the uh, GoToWebinar control panel. But um, Will, let's, let's talk a little bit about, about fueling. Um, what would you say, just generally speaking, are the biggest challenges uh, when it comes to fueling these Olympic lift workouts? Yeah, so um, with, during the training stage, there's, there's kind of two factors, right? If you talk like the training of Olympic lifting, um, you know, if you look at it, it's brief, fast, you know, it takes, you know, the snatch can take less than a second, the bar's moving really fast, you'd be like, fuel, what are you talking about, right? But we practice and we train for these maximal lifts, and it may take you 15, 20, 30 minutes to get up to a maximal lift. So in that time, I, the you know the primary energy system that we're going to tap into is that creatine phosphate, that fast, uh, really fast, and then we're going to start tapping into glycogen reserves, uh, and then they're going to expire pretty quickly thereafter. And and you know the creatine phosphate system is what we want because we want that ATP stored, boom, do the lift, and then once we do that lift, it's probably gone after the first set or two, and so we need fuel there that is going to be longer lasting, that can get us through, because the aerobic system is actually what recovers any strength athlete in between lifts, right? You do a lift, you're sitting there, you're not, you know, anaerobic, you're aerobic, you're breathing, you're trying to get that system, so we need that, you know, that fuel in there, that uh, can go through and become ATP for us to use on the next lift. So typically, you know, it's really difficult. You either go with, you know, a, a carb that you start. And so carbs are really, really important for those sorts of lifts. It's almost impossible to do without carbohydrate at some point in your system. So, you know, a lot of options that you might run into when we go is, you know, like, sweet potato or rice or something like that, and that gets pretty heavy in the stomach, and timing-wise, that can be really difficult. Or you go with fruit or something like that. I'm a big whole foods kind of person, but fruit or whatever. And that, that one, if your training session starts getting into the 30, 40, 50-minute window, you usually see a drop if you don't hit that at the perfect timing. So it becomes really difficult, but it's definitely carbohydrate-fueled uh, because – we're trying to replenish that creatine phosphate system all the time. You gave a, a, a really good kind of example about my next question for you. It was it's not just you know thinking about carbohydrates, but it's also kind of understanding you know how different carbohydrates act in your yeah. system and, and kind of how long they'll last you, which which you know you just talked about in the context of food. Um, and you know in in the context of I guess strength training and lifting we, we hear a lot about protein and 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 proteins always of course emphasized for the muscle building aspect of it but from the energy standpoint of training um, that's you know like you talked about where the carbohydrates come in so you yeah um, yeah sorry go ahead no I mean you 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 talk about protein that's you know every high school kid who comes in here is like how much protein should I yeah. take right. And it's like, wait, wait a second, let's let's back up, let's look at all of it, right? And, you know, for the primary energy source, for much, much of strength training is going to be that carbohydrate. Uh, so I think that's hugely important. Now, post-workout, we got to, uh, if we did a really intense strength training program, we, we need protein in there for that repair and regeneration afterwards. But fueling through the workout, uh, all too often people go, 
you know, make the mistake in strength training, they're going to drink protein before, thinking about what's going to happen after, or they just load up on pre-workout that's like full of caffeine, right? Yeah. So, uh, and so we're not really getting any fuel there that's you, that's easily available uh, during the session. So strength training is a huge carbohydrate thing that people don't even think about a lot of times. So I, I'll, I'll come back to the contrast you made, you know, and from a whole food standpoint, you were contrasting, you know, the sweet potatoes and the brown rice, your, your low glycemic, more slow burning carbohydrates to your fruits, which are more going to give you that rapid energy. And then from a sports nutrition standpoint, you know, certainly we see the industries full of those kind of things that act like, you know, fruit in the sense of, of the, your gel products, your chews, your, your sugar-based sports drinks that are going to give you that quick energy and not sustain you. Now, I know one of the reasons we, we you know, started speaking with you is when you became also a little bit familiar with UCAN um, from a fueling standpoint and a carbohydrate standpoint, but, but this is a, a carbohydrate that, that behaves very differently and is going to be more like that brown rice or, or that sweet potato in terms of that slow release effect versus the sugar. Um, take, take us back to how did you hear about UCAN, how was it introduced to you, and what intrigued you about it when you heard about it? What made you think, hey, this might add something different than, you know, most of the sports nutrition carbohydrate products that I'm used to seeing. Yeah, so Seth, uh, I don't know if our viewers are familiar with Seth at all, but Seth was a IU grad, and we've, we've just kind of connected, and he was in the same program as I was, and so we connected years ago uh, when UCAN was first kind of gaining momentum and talked about it, and I tried samples then, and I loved it, but my training wasn't really, really intense. Um, my wife uh, is a competitive triathlete and so she was like big on it right uh, and then I reconnected with Seth and we were talking and I said hey I got this big competition coming up and I'd really love it and I kind of thought twofold was uh, I trained in the middle of the day because I own a gym so it was very uh, it was like breakfast wouldn't hold me but my mid-morning snack was just like not cutting it right so I don't I try oatmeal or then I, or banana, or then I try oatmeal and banana, and it just wasn't cutting it. And so my training, I could tell just a dip in it uh, when I, you know, in the middle of the training would just kind of peter out, right? And so uh, Seth said, hey, try it. Why don't you try it again? And so, uh, and I just noticed a huge difference in my training and that uh, this was a carbohydrate that was just sustaining me throughout. Um, you know, I could have it you know, an hour or two hours before training, uh, and my timing didn't even have to be perfect on it, right? Whereas the whole food kind of stuff, I would, like, have to really time it up uh, to make sure it would, like, hit it, you know, oatmeal at this time, banana at this time, or whatever, but I could just, you know, have you can or the you can snack or whatever, and then go into training, uh, you know, and feel pretty good. So I didn't have to be, like, I didn't have to be, like, spot on with my timing because it was lasting so long. The second factor was I felt like more satiated and weight weightlifting as it's in itself is uh, is a weight class sport so I had this big competition coming up the Masters National Championship which occurred a couple months ago and I needed to be at a certain weight to train so that I could compete at a certain weight uh, and so I didn't have any problems with a weight cut uh, throughout that time which was uh, unusual in the past I'd always kind of as you get to training, your appetite grows, and you know I was really worried about gaining too much weight. So UCAN was really good for me to uh, maintain weight throughout that entire time, which is something that I didn't even think about. But I was like, hey, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not coming out of training just like, oh, give me all the food, right? I could take uh, my protein supplement for repair, but then uh, wait and eat at dinner later, you know, or some, or eat my lunch or something like that. So it wasn't, it wasn't like gobbling up food because I, you know, my blood sugar was stable. I was able to just make it through, you know, I made through training really well and, you know, my weight stayed really close to the weight class and so I had one of my best performances I've ever had in my life uh, because I was able to keep my weight really stable too. So that was a kind of a side benefit for me and in weightlifting that's a huge benefit uh, where, hey, can you train near where you compete and so that, that was huge. And that's that's really fascinating to hear on a lot of levels. One of the things you were saying at the end too is kind of what it all ties back to in terms of your your blood sugar being stable, right? So for for those that may not know what Will and I are talking about when we talk about you can, Will alluded to the fact that 
You can see it over my shoulder. It comes in powder format. It comes in bar format as well. I think this guy, the cinnamon, is the one that, that you've had some experience with. But what's really unique about UCAN from a carbohydrate standpoint is rather than using sugar or maltodextrin or, or some type of um, you know, fast-acting, high-glycemic type of sugar, uh, we're using a very complex, slow-releasing starch. So we call this carbohydrate super starch. That's what you find in the powders and the bars. And, and the whole background and origins of it were that it was developed for our founder's son with life-threatening hypoglycemia or life-threatening low blood sugar. So the only reason this starch exists was to help kids who struggled processing carbohydrates and converting them into glucose to give them energy. It was really developed as a sustaining and slow burning energy source to help these kids maintain steady blood sugar. But as Will's uh, described to us, you know, that, that idea of keeping your blood sugar level steady, whether it's for energy so you can perform, whether it's to help control your appetite so you're not coming out of a workout with your blood sugar all the way down and, and just want to eat everything in sight, uh, that, that's really what we're finding the application of UCAN for, for athletes, you know, and, and for, for everyday exercisers or gym goers or just people looking to maintain their energy. So, so there is a, a bit of a why, you know, to, to, with, it's interesting, everything you're describing, it kind of adds up with the idea of what keeping your blood sugar steady promotes. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess I say this all to say, it's not just like you were, you were imagining this, there's actually a, a metabolic effect to why you were feeling this, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, you know, in terms of um, the experiences of your athletes, have you had any athletes uh, outside of yourself um, play around with UCAN, and, and has the experience been similar if you have? Yeah, so, um, uh, well, obviously I told my wife has been really yeah. successful, has used it, uh, you know, on the bike or, or out of the swim and stuff like that during half Ironmans and stuff like that. So she's really enjoyed it, uh, but in the, like, strength and conditioning strength type sports uh we've been recommending it with some of our weightlifting crew who have been uh, competing in weight classes and using it as you know that snack uh pre-training or whatever to control blood sugar so they aren't feeling overly hungry they're going to then uh be able to stay close to their weight class and they've they've all had similar kind of stories as me is oh it, it was e this is the easiest it's ever been for me to hit my weight class this is uh you know i felt pretty great throughout my whole training session uh that kind of stuff so uh we've had athletes and these are you know nationally competitive athletes where they're going to university national championships or the senior national championships so they've really really enjoyed it and uh so we've had tons of positive experiences on the strength training side and obviously my wife on the endurance side has really enjoyed it Cool. That's great. Great feedback. Well, good, to, good stuff to hear. Um, well, we'll get you out of here with a couple questions um, from the audience. So um, Kyle uh, wants to know if I, I think you might, may have talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but if I have no experience with Olympic lifting, but want to give it a try, what would be the general learning curve in terms of time if I were to work with a trainer or a professional that, that knows what they're doing? Yeah, I think you can expect um, that within the first couple days or a week, you're gonna know how to do it. You might not be great at it, but you're gonna know how to do it, and you can probably do a variation, maybe a, you could do a hang power snatch and a hang power clean pretty competently and start getting some benefits out of it, right? You could start loading it up and with someone keeping a little bit of a watchful eye on yourself, um, you'll be able to get some benefits out of it from that like uh, rate of force development, that explosiveness that we're talking about. Uh, you know, to be, you know, going further, it might take uh, a month or two months to get r really good at it where you're doing, uh, you know, a full snatch that you can see in the Olympics uh, off the floor and you're doing a full clean and jerk from the floor. But I think within the first week, you can expect that you'll be relative, you'll be good enough that you can start putting them into a training program and use them to your benefit, uh, some variation. And then, uh, you know, the more time with a coach or somebody watching you and uh, with the internet now, you know, there's online, the people who can watch you online or I've taught people on Skype before where they like, hey, can you do it? And, and we've done it. It's a little slower, right? You know, say, hey, we're going to stop here and this is your practice and this is your homework. Send me a couple videos on text and we'll check it out. But, you know, you can do that. So, uh, you know, I, I normally suggest, hey, first thing, try to find somebody in person who's USA Weightlifting certified or similar 
where they can you know teach you the basics of the lifts and, and get good at it. And so if you have, if you're in a city uh, that has a CrossFit, they likely have somebody like that, uh, and tons of gyms have them. But you can look that up and find out. And I think within the first week you'll be doing something that can already benefit your training. And then within you know the first month or two you're going to be able to do the whole lift and, and look pretty good at doing it. Awesome. Um, Tyler wants to know um, what other types of training do you personally do uh, outside of Olympic lifting? Uh, so for myself, uh, when I'm uh, when I'm like not in competitive season, which is now, right, uh, I will do everything. Right, I'll uh, do conditioning. I'll get on the rower. Um, I'll, I do a lot of strength training. I just like strength training, uh, but I may do it in circuit format where I'm doing like interval style, or I may do uh, any number of different things, usually involving weights because I, I like using weights. Uh, but I'll do row, I'll get on the rower, get on the assault bike. I don't run very much. It's kind of not my thing. But uh, other than that, I'll do almost anything. And then when you know competitive season rolls around, that list of exercises start shrinking. Uh, and I'll always do some variation of like a clean or a snatch at least once a week, uh, just because to me it's like it's a sport I like to compete in. So I like to stay sharp and practice, uh, but I use it more as a practice than you know a training tool. And then you know in the 12 to 16 weeks leading up to meet, that list narrows down, and I'm you know just snatching, clean and jerking, doing some squats and stuff like that. Cool. Well, and uh, last one for you. I'll let the, this one come from Jennifer. So she says, as a mom of a youth athlete, you talked about having the high school athletes you work with Olympic lift. Is there any age that's too young to start? Um, you know, we'll, we will start teaching our athletes, if they're a general athlete, uh, at the age of like 13 or so, but it's just on the foundations of like how to do it. And so we have, you know, five kilogram bars, like 10 pounds. We have, uh, you know, 10 kilogram bars. We have 15 kilograms. So we have lots of different bars. And so we'll start teaching them the foundation. And to me, uh, I like to compare any of that strength training stuff that you teach as a fundamental foundation is – we're teaching movement quality first, uh, and then later on, when they have this great foundational movement, then they can start, you know, really pursuing the strength training side of things and the overload principles that we would use later on in life. But we'll start at 12, 13 years old, teaching them the foundations, how to do it right, you know, how to, you know, how to do a clean right, how to squat correctly, how to deadlift correctly, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but try to keep it in a fun environment, all that, uh, you know, so that. They enjoy training, associate positive things with it, and then later on, uh, you know, and we can start developing strength on top of a great foundation of really good movement. So, you know, we'll have a lot of seventh, eighth graders where we're teaching them how to do that, uh, and you know, uh, then when they get that high school age, they can start getting a lot stronger. That's great. And uh, Jennifer, Ken, and Tyler, we appreciate all you guys asking your questions, and and thanks to everybody in the live audience for listening live. Um, Will, this was, was fantastic. Learned a lot. Uh, a lot of great insight from you on, on both the training and the nutrition side of things. Um, if people want to, you know, get more of your insight, get, get your workouts, um, how, how can they connect with you further? How can they uh, view? I know you've put out a lot of, uh, you know, instructional DVDs, uh, books. Um, how can people learn more from you? Yeah, so uh, easiest way to connect with me is on Instagram. I'm at Will Fleming, Will with one L. Um, and so at Will Fleming on Instagram is a really easy way to connect with me. That's where I post Olympic lifting stuff. Uh, I'm always on there so you can message me or whatever. Uh, if you are way interested in Olympic lifting and want to learn, uh, I have a book called The Complete Olympic Lifting Handbook that can be found on, on Amazon, Complete Olympic Lifting Handbook by me or by Will Fleming. That's going to be uh, kind of just my approach to teaching it. Um, a lot of pictures, a lot of like descriptions of how to do things. That's a really good way. Um, the most detailed thing I have out there is I have a certification called the Certified Weightlifting Performance Coach, and that's for co you know coaches who want to learn how to do it for athletes. Uh, and that's just like all the information in the book times a hundred because I want like people to feel like super confident with every reason and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's kind of the next step up. But uh, the book would be a great place to start if you say, hey, I want to read about it, and I'm interested in technically how to do it, and there's some really good training programs in the back of the book that you can get start using right away. Uh, there's beginner templates. There's totally, like, the, like how to learn, all that kind of stuff.